whose life history is told by this piece of wood. What's happened to the sailmakers of days gone by? Why must machines be pretty as well as useful? Who developed an entirely new breed of poultry? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America. Produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Harvesting of a timber crop near Crossett, Arkansas. Not all the trees are felled, only those whose growth has ended, or who are crowding in on neighboring trees, or whose cutting in some other way will benefit the nation and help perpetuate an adequate supply of this important natural resource. How do they know which areas to work, which trees to fell and haul away to the mill? Well, that's the subject of extensive thought and study on the part of experts thoroughly schooled in tree culture and forest management. In fact, believe it or not, this Arkansas forest land happens to be part of the campus of Yale University. For three months each year, through the cooperation of the Crossett Lumber Company, the Yale School of Forestry migrates here from New Haven. Faculty, students, the entire graduate school to put into practice book learning acquired during the rest of the year. Each morning, there's a briefing on plans for the day, and also paperwork in connection with field work of the preceding day. The students are engaged during seven of their 12 weeks here in taking an inventory of forest capital, analyzing it for its usefulness now and in the future. They use all sorts of advanced equipment, like the kale plotter that gives aerial photographs a three-dimensional effect. But the important thing is the work done out in the woods. They recheck old boundary lines, working from landmarks of 80 to 100 years ago. And when the landmark is a tree, finding it can be quite a problem a century later. But find it they must, and then work on to the next one. George Washington, in his youth, spent part of his time doing almost exactly what these young men are doing. But they have certain tools our first president never laid eyes on, like the Abney level that measures the height of an object. Not only the quantity of timber, but its quality as well. By studying the rings of a tree, one can tell how it is grown during each year of its life, and whether its growth is likely to continue. Here's how they get a look at those rings without cutting the tree down. Each ring, one year of life. See how fast it grew in its early years and recently has grown scarcely at all. It'll probably be brought down to make room for new growth. And as the future guardians of our woodlands, these forestry students get a good indoctrination in the vital importance of maintaining the cycle of planting and harvesting, so that each year there's new growth equal to the amount taken out. In much the same way, this college in the woods helps ensure that there will continue to be enough properly trained men to take care of our precious birthright. Fortunately for all Americans, we as a people seem to be possessed with the idea that nothing is perfect, that there's always a better way. This ambitious trait has helped to improve our way of life. It has made possible the better things which might have been out of reach of most of us if we had to depend on outmoded methods. Surveys show that American industry pays employees more than two and a half million dollars each year for their original ideas. These suggestions, no matter how small, benefit everybody by contributing to better production, safer working conditions, and savings in time, effort, and money. When men went down to the sea in ships like this, it was a hundred days from New York to the west coast round the Horn. They've long since dug the Panama Canal, of course, and steam and diesel have largely replaced sails. But here in Portland, Oregon, a company that was founded for the purpose of making and repairing sails for ships outward bound to the Orient or back to the East Coast is still in business at the same old stand. 
still making sails, tarpaulins, hatch covers, and the other canvas articles, essential even on the ocean liners of today. When the company began, you'd never have found women putting in grommets. But times change ashore as they do at sea, and the White Stag Company has learned that women are fully as adept at most jobs as men, and in some jobs, more adept. Actually, only a very small part of the company's production these days involves canvas goods for ocean-going ships or sailors. Quite a while ago, they turned to making waterproof garments for lumberjacks. Then it was sports clothes for amateur fishermen. Now, this. To an old salt, duds like this would be regarded as a big come down for a sailmaker. But don't kid yourself. Fully as much care and skilled craftsmanship go into making a piece of feminine finery as ever went into the sails of the finest clipper ship. Though the fabric they work with remains basically cotton, the same cotton they used when dipping lumberjacks' garments in paraffin for waterproofing purposes, there have been some drastic changes in that department too. Better ways of weaving, finishing and fabricating, not to mention the greater demands of the buying public, have given modern day materials qualities that old seafarers and loggers wouldn't have believed possible. We owe a lot to those old timers, and now from their sail-making lots come sports clothes in which we can enjoy some of the most beautiful country on earth. Here's a Cleveland firm, which like other industrial research and development companies, has just one thing for sale, ideas. Customers of Designers for Industry are, of course, other companies looking for new products to add to their present lines, or, as with this movie projector, looking for better performance and appearance in existing products. After designs are approved, a handmade working model is put together in the machine shop. Production techniques for making the improved product are also worked out. Here's an older style electric hammer. The bit must be turned by hand. Its manufacturer has come to these experts to find a way to make the bit turn automatically. They've come up with an improved type, a handmade model of which is now tested in comparison with the earlier version. Product development begins at a conference with the client to determine exactly what it is he needs to make his product more effective, attractive, and saleable. In this case, it's a representative of the manufacturers of an automatic nailing machine, the Auto Solar Company of Atlanta. What they want is style, improved appearance to match their machine's usefulness. On a transparency laid over a drawing of the device, designers will labor long hours creating an appearance that will reflect the machine's strength, speed, and durability. In the process, they may also be making it safer to use, or quieter perhaps, even easier to use. Position of a control handle, pedal, or lever may be shifted for aesthetic reasons and prove to be handier in the new position. It certainly won't be shifted if it should prove to be less handy. Eventually, back in Atlanta, the improvements are incorporated in auto solars on the production line. Why is it called auto solar? Well, one of the principal uses for the nailing machine is in putting soles, heels, and top lifts on shoes in a fraction of the time it takes when the job is done by hand. Here they are, ready to receive their cases. In addition to the function they'll serve in shoe repair shops, variations of this machine have widespread applications in industry for nailing together boxes, crates, toys, and other products. The nails are formed from a spool of wire and can be cut to any desired length from two and three quarter inches down to a mere eighth of an inch. In less than three minutes, it can put a new set of heels on a pair of shoes. Another demonstration of how industries depend on each other in their task of providing the constantly improving goods and services we Americans have come to expect.
It's a fabulous America. More than 300,000 enterprises of the kind you see from time to time on industry on parade. Some are one-man shops, others corporations with nearly half a million employees. Each was small to begin with. Each grew as America grew. And you are responsible for their growth because you want and buy their products. As your demand increases, men and women in all walks of life risk their money for the purchase of new and improved machinery. The result? Better products, more of them, and at lower prices. That's the unparalleled system that brings Americans the good things of life. Steuben's Restaurant in Boston, one of many across the land in which gourmets are being treated to something new in the poultry line. It isn't chicken, it isn't duck, it isn't guinea hen. It's a dish you may never have heard of, rock Cornish game hen, a bird all of whose meat is white, legs, second joints, breast and back. Very understandable if you haven't heard of it, for up to just a few years ago, the bird did not exist. has been increased, doubling each year for the past four years. Today, well over 20,000 birds are hatched each week. And as steadily as chicks are hatched, others reach the six-week point, just the right size so that when dressed, they'll weigh an even pound or enough for one serving. The processing plant now receives birds from poultry houses scattered for 10 miles around. And here's how they go out to the consumer, wrapped in a moisture-proof, transparent cover and packed down in ice, looking like so many miniature turkeys, but tasting not at all like them. Thus has one man's inability to retire created a bustling new industry. And it's an industry that has taken an Epicurean table delicacy and by crossbreeding and mass production methods, made it available for those of us who, though we don't refer to ourselves as Epicures or gourmets, like good things to eat just the same. Three orders of Rock Cornish Game Hen coming up. 